first of all, uh, what I want to do is just welcome everyone to Earth Day. And, and as you saw in our, our poster, the idea is to sort of recognize uh, connections to the Earth every day, ideally. And um, but first of all, I'll introduce myself and then uh, Joseph. And I also want to acknowledge Tara, who's making all of this happen. Technically, you cannot rely on me to do anything remotely technical or I would have probably kicked everybody out by now or something terrible like that. Um, so I'm uh, Deborah McGregor. I'm Anishinaabe from Whitefish River First Nation. Uh, I also work at York University at Osgoode Hall Law School in the um, Faculty of Environmental and Urban Change. I'm also the director for the Center for Indigenous uh, Knowledges and Languages and have a number of research projects, Indigenous Environmental Justice and Self-Determined um, Climate Futures, which is also assisting with the um, with today's um, discussion. So I am really thrilled to be here. I managed to uh, to cajole Joe into, <laughs> into coming today. He's busy because I'd imagine this time of year is very busy. And we thought this would be an amazing time to talk to, to Joseph. So for those who don't know Joseph, first I'll say he's really amazing. Um, I always say he's He's very charismatic. He, he loves this topic. You can you can see the passion coming through. He knows his stuff. He's just got so many stories. Um, I remember once he was doing a week long um, medicine, I guess you could say, workshop plant workshop in, in my community. Just so many stories, like like all day of stories. Just so much knowledge. Um, and so I asked him to come today, uh, partly to to get people to start thinking about what our relationships might be to the natural world through plants. Um, and one of the reasons why, uh, there's a whole bunch of reasons why this is important that, that Joseph will talk about, but one of them is, um, I find in the, what I'll call the indigenous world, like when I'm in those meetings, um, I often get asked a lot, um, what do we need to do to basically try to save the planet, right? Because all these disaster reports come out from the International Governmental Panel, Panel on Climate Change, the IPBS report, the species extinction. And in the Indigenous point of view is that it always has to do with that connection to the natural world. That connection has been disrupted for Indigenous peoples for all kinds of reasons. Colonization, probably many, many of you know about that. I'm not going to delve into that history because we want to hear from Joe. But And so a lot, a lot of what they say is we need to be able to connect again. We need to be able to do this. Um, and then I kind of get stuck on exactly how to do that because I don't have Joe's depth of knowledge about how to go about um, how to go about doing that but it is a question that I get frequently it is understood to be one of the root causes of, of why we're facing the situation that we're facing now so Joseph um, Tara can drop uh, something in the the chat the link to the creator's garden amazing program you'll find you could google Joseph and you'll find all kinds of stuff because I did um, <laughs> recently <laughs> to see what he's up to um, lots there and one of the things that, that we talked about that I would um, like him to share with you, um, but ideally this is a bit more of a dialogue and hopefully there's opportunities for more dialogue with you coming into this, um, coming into this, uh, uh, to this dialogue or this talk this afternoon is, is what are we seeing right now? Um, and uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna just put this idea in your head and, and Joseph can take this in whatever direction that he wants is, I remember him saying in one of the workshops is, People tend to develop relationships with plants, even if that might even be too strong of a word, at certain times of year, it could be harvesting or when they're planting and they don't do it like all year round. They don't develop that relationship all year round. And speaking for myself, I tested myself on this and I went to go see, you know, what lady slippers look like in the spring. And I couldn't, I couldn't recognize what they look like when they're just coming up. I couldn't recognize what they look like when they weren't flowering in August and I realized I'm pretty ignorant for someone who should know about this kind of stuff, right? So we realize that this relationship has to happen over time in the middle of winter at other times of the year. So I just, I thought that was really significant because of the depth of ecological knowledge that you need to have in order to be able to develop relationships with plants, but it's also something that anyone can do. So, so those were the things that were top of mind for me. There might be other things that are top of mind for you that you would like to engage in discussion with Joseph with, but with that, because really you're here to listen to Joseph rather than me talk about my epiphanies. Um, so <laughs> well, I'll turn it over to, uh, 
to Joseph to set us off on, on this day, but I really glad you're able to join us um, and, and hopefully you'll enjoy you know, the next uh, hour and a half as much as I will. I'll, I'm, I know I'm gonna learn a ton. Miigwech. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> yeah, no, that's good. I Thank you so much. <clears throat> um, <laughs> I, uh, yeah, you know, one of the things that, just just while you were talking, I was like uh, thinking of um, my daughter, uh, Ruth. She's always out with us in, in the bush. She doesn't really care too much about picking medicine, though. Uh, but um, the so, so like I harvest and I teach about like 230 to 250 different species of medicine, like lots. And, and the majority of my teaching is spent, you know, dedicated to um, helping those plants. So like, you know, learning what medicine is, is really easy to kind of just like, Oh, this is lung medicine. This is kidney medicine. This is heart medicine. This is bone medicine. This is, and it's like, Oh, okay. Learning medicine is actually pretty easy. And especially because like the way that we ingest all of these different kinds of medicine is just tea for the most part. Like, so it's just like, Oh, I make tea with this and then everything is okay. Okay. That's real easy. The work though, is like when you actually go out, uh you don't just pick the uh you don't just pick the plants you, there's this there's like a process we call it protocol um but it's kind of interesting the protocol for harvesting it's always uh embedded in this one idea is that is that you always have to merit your ability to harvest that plant before you even pick it and so um you, you have to do some work prior so before, uh, yeah, before you have successfully merited your ability to harvest it, so you have to help first. And that's a kind of something that a lot of people will forget and just go out and pick medicine um, uh, without that responsibility piece. Um, but um, that's where I spend most of my time and energy teaching. And it's actually really fun because um, to work with that many plants and to know all of the protocols of harvesting you have to be outside all year um, and you have like for seed collection and for taking root cutlets and uh, like when you're walking through a forest um, and you notice that there's some plants that are missing, some medicines that are missing, it's your job to put it there. And so me and Ruth and uh, my family moved to Peterborough a couple of years ago. And so me and my daughter will cruise around and I'll go check out all the bush places. I don't even have the time it's on private property I bet but we're just like driving around everywhere and um, yeah we'll just see a, a forest where there's plants that are missing and we'll just say hey we'll bring some seeds here next time and put it here so we're just like constantly diversifying it well I keep saying we my daughter is just like catching frogs and snakes and turtles and stuff like it's just me doing all the work but, um, but she's always there and uh, just her being around, like she doesn't, she could care less about medicine. There's only one plant that she'll actually come out with us and pick, but she really doesn't, she really doesn't care, but she's learning passively. Um, so I had these, um, I wonder, I think I have them somewhere, uh, but I had, um, I got a bunch of grouse um a bunch of uh partridge some people will call them bush chickens um these birds and uh we got like four or five of them um we were just picking taking our nets out uh we had our nets under the ice and then there was some partridge there so we got them and brought them home it's like all right make a real good soup for everybody uh but you know how like grouse they do not have the uh teeth to chew their food and so they'll they'll eat all of the food and then they'll store it it's called a crop it's like this big uh um it's like a stomach that sits uh, uh, on their neck and then they'll slowly take everything that they're eating and and uh, uh stuff that's stored inside of the crop and then it goes into a gizzard and the gizzard is just a muscle and it and it contracts and it squeezes so the bird will fill that gizzard up with rocks and then it'll deposit some of the leaves and fruits and seeds and things and then that gizzard crushes all of the uh so well i guess it's kind of weird to say but the bird will eat teeth and put teeth in that muscle and then crush it all up together and then that's that's how it chews up its food um and those those grouse too the reason why we got them is because um they'll look out on the 
uh, when the sun is at a certain angle, they'll go out and look for their rocks because they will only find um, quartz rocks, um, uh, rocks that have a certain hardness level. Uh, so like flintstones above a hardness of uh, seven and above. And th these rocks crystallize um, uh, in a certain way um, that they'll create reflections. Uh, and so the bird will go out when the sun is at a certain angle, like in towards the evening, and it'll find all of the rocks that have this certain reflection that can guarantee to the bird that it's a very hard rock. And so it's almost always picking quartz and flints, uh, flintstones. And then that's what it puts in its gizzard. Because if it grabbed like a very soft shell type of rock, then all of this rock would just crumble. It would not be a good tooth, you know, to put into that gizzard. <clears throat> so they were all on the road eating finding those stones so that they could chew up their food for the evening or throughout the night. And uh, that's how we got all those birds. But when I opened that gizzard, I got my daughter. I said, come over here, check this out. I'll show you the whole process. I opened the gizzard, opened up and saw all of the rocks. And my daughter is obsessed with rocks. There's rocks in every door in, in our vehicle. There's rocks in every pocket that she has. Every time we do laundry in the summer, there's just rocks everywhere. And then, so when I opened up the gizzard, she saw the stones and she was like, hey, look, look at all these rocks. And then she's already digging in. And, uh, and then she noticed there was a bunch of other seeds inside of that gizzard too. And then what really freaked me out though, is because she was able to recognize what plants those seeds were from. And she was five at the time. So she said, hey, these are from uh, bearberry, the binicolis. And then these ones are from um, the, um, the, I forget, the, it's called, that is uh, 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 the lily of the valley, Canada's false lily of the valley. And then she recognized sumac seeds and she was just, she recognized all the seeds because that's all we're doing. We're so focused on um, collecting all of the seeds from all the plants that she sees us processing them everywhere. So that when we opened that gizzard, she was able to recognize almost all of the different types of, uh, there's eight different species of seeds. And she knew what, the, what they all were um, just because of, um, just by uh, passively learning just by being in the same environment as us, I guess. Uh, but yeah, that's a huge part of what we do is, um, is just constantly um, uh, making sure our medicine is everywhere that it can be, constantly diversifying all of our territory. And um, that increases, of course, the health of the environment, but also like increases our own access to all of these really good medicines. Uh, and so... It was super fun, just uh, some of these uh, um, realizations that we've been having over the years. But yeah, just to watch her kind of recognize everything um, and to, to already have kind of that experience or that this is a normal thing to do uh, um, is super fun. But yeah, that uh, um, I'm really excited for, for this year. Um, last year, we didn't even really pick any medicine at all, just some addictions medicine, and that was it. But we were mostly just just being responsible, I guess. <laughs> we we're just like spreading seeds everywhere, and my yard in Peterborough is full of all kinds of weird plants, and uh, that should not really be here, but <laughs> it's all over. Uh, but yeah, all year last year, my daughter was catching frogs, and I was uh, just spreading medicine plants around in, in areas where where they need to or should be could be um yeah it was super sweet maybe actually one of the other things i i really find interesting i mean there's a number of things and just in talking about your your daughter ruth and how she's learning is just to share with folks how you, how you learned, like just, I mean, this gets into the ecological knowledge, intergenerational passing on knowledge from generation to, um, to, to generation, how you would have, how you would have learned and perhaps some advice for folks again, because this year I think is, 
well, not this this year, this time of year, I think is really fascinating for kids because they can see a lot happening in a short period of time, or maybe that's just my bias. That's how I think about the spring, like a lot happens in a really short period of time. And if you have a short attention span like me, there's actually things you can pay attention, attention to from day to day um, and then see changes and sort of appreciate like regrowth and, and life as, as, uh, as it progresses into the season. Yeah. Um, uh, so, well, I guess I, I just learned by, I would just be visiting with my grandma and, um, I honestly, I kind of didn't really believe much that she was saying either. <laughs> I was just listening to these crazy, uh, stories from my grandma because she never had a hospital. She, uh, walked everywhere and, um, you know, no car, no horse, nothing, you know, so like, you know, if you get sick or injured, you needed medicine. And I just thought that was ridiculous because my mom's a nurse and she's like real good too. So I was like, man, what the heck? Um, this is kind of like really weird. But then I started giving people, I started going and finding medicine so that because my grandma was like missing them. She was like, she was talking about them in a longing kind of way. So I was like, well, I'll just, we'll go find it. So she would describe what they look like. And then we'll, me and my wife would go and find them and bring them to her. And then, uh, and she would make some tea, but then she would start telling everybody, Oh, Joe found this plant. Uh, Joe found goggles. It's hard to find. And he, and he found it. And she's just like, well, I don't know, proud of her grandson or whatever, but people start knocking on my door and they're like, Hey, I heard you have this medicine. <laughs> so I just give it to them. And then, uh, their whatever medicine it was, their COPD, you know, one woman, couldn't even walk like 10 feet without catching her breath with an oxygen tank. And then uh, a couple of months later, she was like walking around all over, no oxygen tank, slow jog. I was like, what the heck? And she was like, Oh, thank you for that medicine. <laughs> and I was like, what? And then, like people with fibromyalgia, hot flashes, some of my first uh, arthritis. I really spent a lot of time in, with these kinds of plants and giving them to people because it was helping them. And then in my community, kind of just thrusted me into a teaching role and uh, started teaching about medicine. And then other communities were like, oh, some kid in Wiki is doing this. So then I started going and teaching everywhere. Uh, and then it just really snowballed into like a, a really kind of genuine focus of mine, I guess. And uh, then I started to, you know, build capacity within the community to finding uh, and preparing all of these medicines but they were stopped at the, the physician or the pharmacist would stop them and say, we can't do this. So I had to learn lots of the science and uh, sciences, health sciences, anatomy and physiology things to be able to learn what the plant is doing, to be able to show the doctor or the pharmacist that, that it's okay or, or that it's not okay. Um, and, uh, and that kind of, um, you know, learning from my grandma and getting thousands and thousands of stories anecdotes um from communities and scouring you know uh literature and drug discovery research that's done on medicine to learn what plant medicine is doing uh to be able to have conversations with uh well anybody i guess um but uh, that was my main job and focus was always on health and well-being and increasing our access to health and of course medicine is a really important pathway for that so that's what i focused on uh, for for a really long time um, but yeah learning about um, uh, how much the medicine knowledge from the Great Lakes region contributed to almost every major uh, pharmaceutical drug that has ever been discovered it comes from our home and so it was like super fun taking physicians out in the bush and looking at a flower like hey you know uh this is digoxin <laughs> uh, and, and this is uh, tamoxifen and, and these are, uh, you know, HMG coi reductase inhibitors or this is SGLT2 inhibitors or like whatever, it comes from this plant, the idea of these drugs. And then the, the idea that you could be, um, what we are doing when we're asking for nishnabemshkike, when we're asking for our medicine is um, we're going to the source of medicine you know, like a digoxin to control hypertension, uh, we could go directly to the plant and not to the synth synthetic mimetic um, that the pharmaceutical industry has made up 
we could go right to the source to where it, um how do you say um, there's not like uh um uh just one synthetic mimetic like a like a pharmaceutical drug there's like uh, 200 different chemicals inside of that plant that are all helping to restore normal function to something inside of your body and so when we're going to the source we're going to a better place to be able to achieve healing and uh to get to get at health and well-being um and so i just kind of took that and and ran with it, I guess, just learning some of these ideas and sharing these, building our knowledge capacities uh, that were very effectively broken down, like you mentioned, uh, but to build those back up in our communities and, and to get us uh, interested in, and connected to our traditional medicine and so that we could see value in it and pursue it uh, in our healing experiences. Um, so... Yeah, just kind of like in a in a nutshell, that was my whole sort of process. Um, but oh man, I'm like real possessed now. I dropped my daughter off at school this morning, and I I it took everything in me. I had one meeting planned for around ten o'clock, and uh, I could have had an hour to go and visit some of the plants. <laughs> We just have a couple of real cool green spaces near our place in Peterborough and uh, all kinds of medicine. Everything is just popping out of the ground now. And, so, and, uh, and, and uh, the, the spring is, is a really, really beautiful time of year. And yeah, you're absolutely right. Like kids really uh, 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 can see all of these really incredible processes, all these plants popping up and, uh, uh um everything just starting to come back my daughter's asking every day if the spring peepers are singing yet uh so that because so, so we could go to the swamp and and listen to their uh chorus at night uh, of all of the different frogs and to catch all of the salamanders that are that are coming up and uh breeding right now um that, that's that's her favorite thing but um for for me uh, the, the spring, w one of the things that I wait for the most is, um, birds. <laughs> I'm real obsessed with birds, like to a fault. They just control. I can't even sleep past five o'clock in the morning anymore because all the robins are starting to go and I just, I just got to listen. And, um, but, um, there's this, uh, one flower that probably everybody will know called the trillium, um, uh, tr trilliums are going to be coming up pr pretty soon. Uh, I went uh, on Easter weekend and in Peterborough, the leaves, uh, the little um, uh, bud was just coming out of the ground. And so I bet those leaves are already opening. Um, and the, the second that you see that flower start to open, what we call that plant, what we call trilliums is uh, Bosch Kajibuguni. Uh, Bosch Kajibuguni is the trilliums. Um, and, um, well, that word is describing something that that's happening. So, um, uh, a gun, we'll call a gun, Bosch is a gun. And, uh, that that's describing the, the noise that the gun makes. Bosch is a gun is a, is a really loud noise or what's that word? Uh, oh, no, never mind. Uh, but like really loud noises that would, that's a, the word or the sound we use to describe that. And, um, and Bosch Kajibuni is, um, uh, just talking about the, well, Jeep gun is a root and, um, Wabuguni is the flower. And so when you kind of put it all together, if you're doing it this way, uh, there's something about a really loud noise and the root of this plant, uh, and the flower of this plant, um, and I think uh, one of the things there's is describing two things, and it sort of really connects me and my daughter's passions, mine being birds and plants, and my daughter's being all of the herps, all of the frogs and turtles and, and salamanders and skinks and things like that. Um, so when the, when, the when the plant first starts to emerge from the root, there's a series of loud noises that happen. All, it's usually when the robins start to sing in the morning and it's when the spring peepers start to sing in the swamps every morning and every night. Um, and uh, those can be 
pretty loud like especially if you get a good flock of robins and and you're standing in front of a, a swamp full of spring peepers um gazebo that's what we call that frog and it's like piercing kind of uh echoing screaming um they're describing the sound that that frog makes but if you're ever at a swamp that's just full of spring peepers it's like uh deafening me my wife and my daughter a couple of years ago went to a swamp that i was i found was just so packed um and it was so loud it was like uh you remember high school dances you go to dance and then you get home after and then your ears are just ringing after our ears were ringing we were trying to go to bed my daughter was complaining about her ears all i hear is the frogs she was saying but she wasn't hearing the frogs it was just ringing uh, so when the when the plant first comes out of the root that year, you, you get this big, uh, loud noise because springtime is very quiet. Uh, like if you go out right now, uh, well, especially like a week ago or two weeks ago, um, spring was very, very silent. There's not much happening. There's no birds. There's no bugs. There's no frogs yet. There's no nothing, no noise. And then all of a sudden you get this big rush of noise. And if you go out in the forest and look that the plant is starting to come out of the trilliums. Um, and, and so my mom just sent me a text this morning. She, she heard robins were very loud this morning for the first time. And so I want to tell her, go look for the trilliums because it's, that plant is just going to be coming out of the root. And, and then the other part of that name is Bosch Kajibik. That's that's talking about the loud noise that that emerges from the roots of that plant. But uh, it's also the, the full name of this trillium flower is Bosch Kajibuguni. So there's a gesture to the flower as well. And this is my favorite part is when that flower chooses to bloom is when everything comes back. That's when all of the insects come back. Um, that's when all of the warblers come back. Warblers are these really, really small little birds, but they are so loud. They make the loudest noise for the tiniest little birds. And they come in flocks of millions to Ontario because of all of the insects. So when you start to hear all of the insects and all of the warblers come back, that dawn chorus in the morning and at, at night is so loud, and you don't just have spring peepers uh, singing in the swamps. You have uh, like almost eight species of frogs that are all involved in this chorus. And so when that flower blooms, there's a massive, super loud experience. Uh, so that's why we call trilliums Bosch Kajibuguni there. That flowers bloom is uh, um, an, an indication into our calendar and just kind of like a representation of what is taking place at that time. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's really, really loud. I, I wanted to get creative this year to try to share that experience with as, with as much as I could, but I got too busy. <laughs> I was going to try to capture that, you know, with little mic microphones or something like this. Um, but it was, it was pretty neat. So like, just when you're thinking about springtime and, and kids and that, that, that connection to, all of the things that are happening right now, it's so exciting. There's so much that's just right there. And we're just waiting for those trilliums to bloom. It's like as if they control what's happening. Obviously, they're just they're subject to everything that's taking place. But um, when those flowers bloom, yeah, there's a real loud um, experience that that comes with that. So this is what we call it, Bosch uh, Kajibuguni. But thinking about spring, I really like trilliums. I really, um, yeah, I really like that story because within, like within the, the trillium blooming is actually a lot of ecological knowledge because all these other, like you can expect all these other things to happen. And if they don't, then of course we have a problem. Um, and so um, the, the, I think the, the other thing, if you're able to reflect on it is um, again, related to those ecological kind of relationships that is bedded within plant knowledge is, and, and our responsibilities to take care of plants also means responsibilities to other critters. So what I, I mean by that is, because, you know, people get really hostile about rodents, people get really hostile about certain, <laughs> certain other insects, you know, uh, all these other, all these other critters or creatures or beings that, that, you know, different people depending on their clan or what they do also have relationships with, right? Like how they're so integral in terms of 
being responsible or having um, relationships to those um, to those plants. Um, and if you wanted to reflect on that, because I, I try to remember that sometimes when, um, you know, if I see certain rodents that are supposed to be like the enemy or something, ah, I got to eradicate. Was I like, actually no? They're really key to being able for the plants to to do it their thing or to propagate or it's being responsible to allow them to do that or facilitate that or it's part of this caretaking responsibility. So I think that's important for people to know as well because we can be so isolated with our little gardens and our little plots that we forget that it's actually connected to so many other, including the bear or to fish or to things that people wouldn't normally be making these um, connections to. Yeah, sweet. Okay, so like <laughs> first thing that I thought of, you know, tent caterpillars. Um, the tent caterpillars uh, have been really, really bad in the Peterborough kind of GTA area um, over the past couple of years. Uh, they exist in these cycles, though. Some years they're really bad, and some years there's almost none at all. And one of the things that we know about tent caterpillars is that they, um, what what makes them the reason why they're stuck in these cycles and why they're just not living in a steady, constant population is because, um, uh, or why their populations boom and crash is because um, as their population grows, their insult to the environment grows. So the trees that they're eating are all insulted. They're all like, hey, why are you, you're completely defoliating me. <laughs> and, uh, and it could seem like that, you know, in the middle of summer, it just looks like fall time. There's no leaves in the forest. It's kind of a real freaky. Or when you walk through the forest, you hear all the caterpillar poop and it sounds like rain. It sounds like it's actually raining, but it's all caterpillar poop because they're just eating all the leaves. Um, one interesting thing we call caterpillars, moussins. <laughs> like a little moose <laughs> because uh moose that's an ashava word right and it's, it describes them they eat all of the twigs they're they defoliate all of the twigs so they're professional defoliators so we will call those moose and um uh but that same sort of um action is what caterpillars do as well so we call caterpillars moose <laughs> like a little uh uh, uh little moose because <laughs> they're accomplishing the same ecological function uh but these caterpillars they they insult the tree and um they're hurting the tree and so the tree is the trees will all say um hey this really sucks um what do we need to do to be able to prevent this from happening um so the tree's immune system is activated and it'll create a host of defense chemicals. And it uses those defense chemicals to protect itself, to make itself taste horrible, to create poisonous substances that, that will harm the caterpillars that try to eat it, um, to, to make sure that you know, the tree survives. Um, and, and so um, these take years. Sometimes in most species, like oak, it can take 10 years of um that insult from caterpillars just growing and growing more caterpillars and more caterpillars and more hurt being applied to the tree and then the tree says hey i i'm going to do everything i can to be able to kill as many of you as possible and make myself taste so horrible that you don't eat me and that you will starve to death and so it it the it can take like five six years for the tree to be able to turn on and create those defense chemicals uh, so it takes long for those defense chemicals to accumulate in the tissues of the tree. Um, but once they do, the caterpillars have nothing to eat. Um, and so their population dies off uh, or, turn, or is reduced to almost nothing. And then it slowly builds back up again. So when the population of caterpillars is reduced to almost nothing, then the tree's defense uh, goes down. And then that population of caterpillars increases. The defense mechanisms of the tree uh, uh, will eventually kill off all the caterpillars again. And you're stuck in these um, 10, 12 year cycles, depending on the species of tree. Um, so that's what's happening. But as an observer, um, when you go and pick medicine, it's kind of like really fun because when you, when you go and pick medicine, you are looking for the plants that have overcome, they have signs of overcoming the most amounts of stress. When you go and pick medicine, you don't just pick the perfect, most beautiful looking trees and shrubs and plants. You have to find the ones 
that have signs and evidence that they've been through it all, that they're old and that they will know what to do. And we, so we find signs of stress. So we wait for tent caterpillars to be very, very bad, to be very, very aggressive, to be a huge insult to those trees. And we wait for those trees, defense, chemicals, uh, protective mechanisms to be able to turn on. And we wait until they're peaking. And that's when we pick that medicine because what, what, what the tree calls defense chemicals, we call medicine. Um, in, in every single plant that we use as medicine, we are harvesting and extracting plant defense chemicals. Um, chemistry that these plants have created to protect themselves are chemicals that will, um, the, the mechanism of our medicines is we, we ingest the chemistry from these plants um, and that chemistry hurts us. It hurts like our cardiovascular system medicine, medicine for our heart and our blood vessels. Um, it, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't just come in and magically protect everything and just clean everything up uh, like, a, like a bunch of little workers you introduce inside of your body. What it does is it stresses your cardiovascular system. It's like an acid that eats away at your, at your veins and at your blood vessels and at your heart. And your body says, hey, there's a poison here there's an acid it's eating away at, at, at my heart and all my blood vessels i need i need to protect myself i need to save myself from this poison and so your body will will um will turn on all of its endogenous capacities all of the uh anti-inflammatory and antioxidative protocols and growth formulas and all of this uh, um, healing opportunities, your body will create all of those and, and to go and heal itself from the damage caused by what we call medicine. But this is why one of the most important distinctions, I guess, is the difference between medicine and poison is the dose. And so we don't have enough medicine to actually cause problems. We have a couple of cups of tea here and there, and that stresses out the system inside of our body. And your body will turn on all to be able to deal with all of the poison. But you didn't have enough poison to cause damage, just enough to create those responses. And so now you have a whole bunch of anti-inflammatory and antioxidative protocols, a whole bunch of uh, healing protocols that will all uh, be able to repair your cardiovascular system. Uh, so it's just like exercise. Uh, maybe I should have started with this, but like when you go to exercise, you're stressing the snot out of your body, you're ripping muscle fibers and tearing your body to shreds, but then you recover from that and your body will recover stronger. Medicine is the same way. It stresses out our body and our body responds to that stress by getting stronger. Um, and so the more stresses that we're applying to more parts of our body, uh, the more stress that we overcome, the stronger we're going to be, whether that's at the gym, with medicine, with nutrition, with a sauna or a sweat lodge or with fasting. These are all hormetic stressors, hormetic meaning that our bodies will adapt to them and become stronger. So whenever we're all picking medicine, we're actually looking for signs of stress. The more stress that signs of stress that we can see on a plant means that there's going to be way more medicine inside of that plant. Uh, so whenever we go and pick medicine, we don't find like all the perfect, real beautiful looking plants and, and trees. They, they will not have the required chemistry uh, to be able to heal us. We have to find the plants that have been through it all, the fungus, the mites, the midges, the, the, the tires, tire tracks, and uh, um, all of these stressors are all indications that that medicine is going to be stronger. Um, and so when we're looking at all, yeah, all these different types of bugs and things like this, um, invasive species and uh, weird funguses coming in from all over the world too, kind of like really wreaking havoc everywhere. Um, those to a certain degree, yeah, can be seen of as like a, uh, as an opportunity, at least from a medicine practitioner standpoint, can be an opportunity. We just wait till 10 caterpillars are real bad. And then our bark baths that year are going to be like way better than if, than without the 10 caterpillars. Um, so it's like a little bit of a perspective shift, I guess, when we're looking at uh, um, these, uh, you know, the insult of invasive species um, can very well be seen in a lot of different cases as uh, um, uh, where it can be a positive spin off of it, I guess. <laughs>
I like that because I was actually just listened to a uh, podcast on stress and it's all about a mindset, right? It's almost like you have to, like you have to put yourself through stress in order. You have to, your mindset is to look at it as growth and strength as opposed to weakening. So it's, uh, um, I, you, the way you said it was a lot more interesting than the hardcore science that I was listening to in an hour and a half long podcast. But <laughs> so I, I was going to ask, I'm going to circle back to, to visiting plants because I think Anybody who's walking their kids to school or they're riding bikes or if they're out at recess time, especially where they actually have access to green space, for lack of a better word, if you didn't have to rush to your meeting at 10, how would you have been visiting those plants? <laughs> like, what, is, what does that look like? What advice do you, because you know, little kids can just like squat there and look at a plant because they're closer to the ground than we are for a long time. You're like, what are you doing? Hurry up, we got to get somewhere on time. Like, what is, <laughs> what is visiting? What is visiting the plants? If you didn't have to rush to speeding at 10 o'clock, what would it, what would it look like? Uh, you, you know, honestly, um, I, I don't know. I think that this would be different for, uh, different, different for everybody. Um, but one of the things that I really like is, um, is kind of, uh, um, that works. Hey, you guys can see that is this, I like showing this to kids like uh, when when we're very young is um, and so my daughter becomes uh, uh, very good at this kind of interpretive technique. So one of the things that we always like to share is that every plant is uh, we're, we're uh, uh, connected to it in in a really kind of uh, real way, I guess. So, so like in our creation story. Um, there's a moment where um, the first human being that was created is inside of a shell. And the shell is a representation of everything that has already been created up until that point. It is uh, the sort of complete uh, uh, representation of all of the elements that make up Earth that were used to create our bodies. And so our bodies are a culmination of everything that was already created up until that point. And we were the last ones to be created. And so we're a culmination of everything. And um, um, this is very consistent in, in almost every creation story that I, that I consult with, um, the, the idea that every, uh, uh, that, that the first person was, uh, the earth was used to create that individual and all, all of the elements that were already created. Anyways, it's a really neat idea. Um, so when we're looking at plants outside, they are a ref, uh, they, they are the source of what created our bodies. And, um, and they are, uh, in a lot of cases, a mirror image of the way that our bodies look um, internally or even externally. And I think there's something really special that happens with kids in, in that image that you describe when they're just uh, stuck staring at a plant like and i think there's a really special kind of memory or consultation that's happening there uh, especially with kids something happens when we get older and we kind of have to work a lot harder to kind of reinforce this practice but um i think that um looking at some of these ideas are really fascinating so you look at any kind of plant and uh it's telling you a story every plant has a story and and uh you know, the and might have the tools required to be able to understand these stories. Like our knowledge is is uh, um, uh, is a, is it has tools to be able to listen to plants. And um, so, uh, I could go through just a couple of images with everybody. It's it's really fascinating for me, anyways. Is um, uh, when you're looking at, uh, oops, looking at all of our different plants, they all share different shapes and structures and geometry, uh, and through their behaviors and interactions with things around them, tell stories that tell us what what they were, what part of our body that they created, <laughs> you know, from this perspective of our uh, creation story. And so, um, when you're, um. Looking at like scouring rush uh, or gzibanushk is our bone medicine, konshkikke. And uh, you tell this to any kid, they already know. Like, uh, could stop at this plant and and kind of just 
apply a simple level of interpretation and kids will almost immediately be able to see joints and bones and and kind of relate to this structure and to say maybe this plant was used to create this part of my body um and so maybe that's what it's going to be good for so kids seem to really attach themselves to this idea really easily and then you know in these joints if you separate a lot of people call it joint grass too if you separate those joints there's this really slippery fluid in there too just like in our joints we have the synovial fluid and uh, uh but this one um yeah it's, re it's really neat when you're looking at uh, your bones every single bone in your body is structured the same way really hard periosteum on the outside spongy bone in the middle and a hollow center for marrow and so the structure of this plant is the same. You cut the plant in half. It has this really hard outside. It's full of silica. It actually glistens in the, in the sunshine like it's full of a shimmer. Uh, and so because of that, it deposits all that really hard crystal in the outside. And then there's a spongy part in the mil middle and a hollow center for uh, uh, inside of this plant. And so it's structured just like every single bone in your body. And we've been using this for like thousands of years to help heal our bones. I use it for osteoporosis and especially aging women. Um, and it gets uh, an aging woman's osteoporosis ridden bones uh, harder than their children. And just sometimes a matter of weeks. So you do a bone density test and it's like through the roof sometimes even setting records at hospitals um, and then communities. I worked with uh, senior centers and they turned this into a contest to see who could score the highest on their bone density test. And uh, it's so fun and fascinating seeing, but, uh, but I, I still think one of the greatest things too, is like just our opportunity to connect with this plant and say, and, and consider all of these creation stories and say, you know, these plants were used to create these parts of our body. They're the source and contained within the source is original instruction. And so when we get sick and there's something wrong with our bones, we need to find these kinds of medicines and consult with that original instruction. And, uh, and, and that, that sort of connection has always been really powerful for me to share with people because uh, it sometimes can be hard to connect to, to nature Sure. connect to creation because you're always busy you always got somewhere somewhere to be um and uh and, and you know you, you could kind of care less about some of these ideas until you need them <laughs> usually uh but yeah it's kind of fascinating to just take a second and uh and really consider some of these ideas and when you're going out and looking at plants looking and understanding the shapes you know when you're visiting how, how do you visit with somebody who is uh non-verbal you're going to be watching all their body language you're going to be listening to them in every other way that does not require ears. <laughs> and so we did the same thing with plants. Like, let's look at this one. Like, whoa, whoa what is this? Uh, that's a really unusual looking leaf. And, uh, and, and, uh, um, and what's that red thing in the background? That's the root of this plant, right? And so you kind of look at it like, hey, whoa, who are you? You look really interesting. Um, and so you could kind of like look to try to listen to it. And um um oh uh, well, these slides are all messed up but if you're looking at these uh just never mind the ha whole half of this uh image <laughs> but um these two sections here women will relate to oh well, some people will say lungs and you know because you have two lungs you have two kidneys you have twin whateverness but women will say well these really remind me of ovaries because uh because this part here because that looks like a cervix as the same shape and structure as a cervix, the same three ridges that cre create a cervix. And so um, it's kind of neat. And then in the middle of it all, um, you have this uh, <laughs> other images like just wrecked. <laughs> uh, but yeah, in the middle of, of it all, you have this and the blue is the stem. And in the center of it all is where the root is. And when you look at the root, it's called blood root because it's this big bleedy thing. You crack it and a bunch of uh, red juice comes out in the perimeter. And to, to really show you like ovaries, the cervix and endometrial lining inside the uterus, because in the middle of all of it is the endometrial lining, right? Or, or sorry, the uterus. And um, that has the endometrial lining inside. And then, uh, uh, and then this, the root will stay kind of fleshy colored in the, on the inside. This is a really amazing women's medicine too. Like we use it for... Um, fibroids and ovarian cysts and polyps on, on and throat mucous membranes. It's a really, really powerful women's medicine. And, uh, but this story is just embedded into the shapes 
and structures of this plant and all of the nonverbal techniques that this plant can possibly utilize to show you this is who I am and this is this is why I'm here. Uh, I I I in the context of our creation story, I helped create this part of your body. And so I contain that original instruction. I can help you with that. And uh, uh, if something goes wrong, and so that consultation is, is there as an option. And it is super fun uh, playing around with uh, some of these ideas. Um, but um, I'll go through a couple. Uh, this one's really fun. Okay. So there's this one, this really cool plant called Nimepin. It's very, very common too, at least in Southern, Southern Ontario, and especially in Southwestern Ontario. Um, but when you're looking at this plant and you say, Hey, who are you? And what are you, what are you here for? What's your gift? Um, and, um, you know, spending some time and visiting with it. One of the things people will notice right away is, Oh, well, like heart shaped leaves. Right. And then when you're looking at the roots, the roots don't stay on top of the, they don't go underground. They stay on top of the ground and they, I know this one's pretty green. They should have this bluish greenish color. And so when you move all of the leaves and you're looking at this nimip and um, it, it, it looks like, uh, you know, the vasculature in somebody's arm. And so you could already be thinking of heart and you could be thinking of blood vessels. Um, and then you're looking at the flower of this plant. That's very, ephem very ephemeral. It's gone by the end of May and it's full of like 50 seeds. But the flower, you're looking at this flower and saying, oh, who are you? And what are you telling me? That's a really interesting shape, like this Mercedes Benz looking shape and structure. Um, what story are you telling me? How can I connect to you? How do you relate to me? And, uh, and then even more importantly, how can I help you? Uh, so let's look at our body, right? You see our heart, that simple heart shaped structure, like the leaf. Um, and then, yeah, maybe the roots really... I mean, they really do remind me, even the bifurcations of the root are just like uh, um, bifurcations in our vascular system, same um, angles and patterns. And it's, it's pretty striking. Uh, but I think one of the coolest things is when you're looking at your vasculature, your vascular system, um, you get these valves, tricuspid valves have this very specific shape, that Mercedes Benz looking shape and structure. It's the only part of your body. In considering every aspect of anatomy and physiology, only one part of your body is going to have that Mercedes Benz looking shape to it, and it's in your vascular system. And so that plant just emulating all of these different components helps us connect to it. And then the history of use, the thousands of years for cardiovascular disease now, utilizing it now for cardiovascular disease, atherosclerosis, uh, and uh, other, you know, inflammatory um, uh, diseases of the vascular system. This is giving us an opportunity now to communicate to somebody, to communicate to plants and say, uh, and then to be able to listen to them and have a conversation to them. I think that's really special. If you have the time, uh, like you could look at violets and say, well, oh, violets are really pretty. They have a heart shaped leaf as well. Um, they have a massive history of use as being vascular medicines as well. You know, they're full of salicylates that kind of help thin your blood a little bit. Um, like salicylic acid will keep your blood, you know, people will even who have cardiovascular disease will have an aspirin a day, right? Because it thins your blood a little bit and that reduces the burden of uh, blockages, helps with the flow, the sheer flow of your blood. If it's super thick, it moves a lot slower and more opportunity for plaque and uh, um, arterial walls to uh, eventually have a blockage. Um, so keep your blood a little bit thinner. Um, I mean, on top of so many other benefits of this medicine, uh, but look at the seed pod. The, when the seed pod opens to release all of the seeds, has the same geometry, same structures, um, trilliums, same shape, same structure, heart, really incredible heart medicines. Um, and then other plants, like really strikingly, dramatically showing you like the vasculature in your, in your legs or arms. And like, this is why I'm here. And so then this gives us a really good opportunity to visit, to listen, to connect. Uh, and then if we, if we learn what we need to know to be able to actually engage in some of these therapies, um, it, it becomes insane. Now we're looking at cardiovascular disease as the number one killer of people globally, uh, and especially in developed world, developed countries. Um, 
and literally the number one killer is it's what removes most people from our planet uh, every single year compared to anything else and most other things combined so it's really crazy and these medicines help with that and they're showing you that they're they're screaming at it every time you walk by if you just stop and listen and 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 uh, you know gain a little bit of tools you need to be able to connect to the story these plants are sharing this is, becomes a very valuable experience um i'm going to show you one more uh just one more old boss one uh where the pictures are not all messed up but it, because this one is out right now if you go out right now almost anywhere in ontario um you're going to be able to find this plant um whether it's round lobed hepatica or sharp lobed hepatica you can see this one now so it's got the most beautiful flowers the flowers are out like when there's still snow on the ground and um uh and um this one benesit some people will say animesit as well because uh, the the leaves look like a dog's paw and then the the the, the veins inside of the leaves look like uh the footprints from a grouse or binet. So you call it a grouse's foot. <laughs> Looks like it got stomped all over by a grouse. <clears throat> but anyways, just kind of looking at this one, the name of it is hepatica. And what we're describing there is the, is the three lobes uh, of the leaf, really kind of resembling the three lobes of the liver. Uh, the name hepatica um, americana, this is... Uh, recognizing its history of use as liver medicines um, uh, when this plant was discovered when when people came over here <laughs> uh, yeah they just named it uh, the liver plant because that's how it was used and it's what it looks like and so you see this in plant taxonomy both from indigenous and scientific perspectives uh, that they're just naming plants based on their purpose and on their look and that correspondence to our body parts um, but um, another one of our liver medicines that you'll be able to see now too is saujipkans. It's not as as common as the hepatica, but uh, it's got three lobes as well. It's got the, this flower that um, has that certain hexagonal structure. Like if you're looking at the flower from hepatica, it's got that hexagon shape too. Uh, and then when you're looking at the saujipkans, it's got a hexagon shape flower. Uh, but this one has bright yellow roots, just like in our huisap. Um, on our liver, that little uh, 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 gallbladder that's hanging on your liver is full of contents that are bright yellow, uh, the bile, the bile salts. And so this, this plant has even more elements of our liver, the three lobes of the liver, the, the hexagon shaped flower, the bright yellow color of the roots. Uh, because when you're looking at your liver, it's a basic structure of a liver. This is what it looks, your liver looks like, anybody's liver looks like under like a very powerful microscope. And they all kind of tack up on top of each other like this. They're called liver lobules. Um, and when you're looking at plants, you go into any health food store and you're like, hey, sir, ma'am, person, can you help me with uh, my liver? They're going to give you a supplement or something that has milk thistle, probably. Um, you look at the stem of every species of thistle. It has a hexagon shape, just like our liver. Um, the flower of Benezit and the flowers of Sawajipkans got this um, hexagon shaped structure, even though you can't really see that last one. Uh, but this is what we should be seeing every time we're outside, every time we're looking at our medicine. Every time we're trying to visit and communicate with somebody that can't talk back, um, there's other ways that we can listen and there's other ways that we can see things and to say, hey, you know, I, I can understand what you're saying. I could, you know, like looking at cedar, what makes you special, different and unique? Um, you know, it's an evergreen, but it doesn't have needles. It has green, flat, scaly looking leaves. And when we look inside of our body, our lymphatic system, what cedar is historically responsible for helping, um, you get the same green, flat, scaly looking structure. And so we are very much uh, kind of have to be connected to plants. It's very explicit. Everything that you look at outside is like a reflection of the way that you look on, on the inside. And more often than not too, yeah, like we're looking at things you need a microscope to be able to see and things that we've only been able to see in the last 40 years. 
Uh, but um, indigenous knowledge has understood this interpretive technique and has been practicing it for thousands of years now to uh, help us remember where those consultations are. You know, where is this medicine to be found? And uh, um, this is probably something like, yeah, maybe, maybe even one of the most important things to do when we're outside and you're sitting in front of a plant trying to connect with it, trying to connect to the to this land. Try, um, there's really explicit ways that you can that that you can achieve this. Um, and it's especially powerful with kids. So now with these perspectives, and like if I was to go over, you know, 50 more species of plants with you, and when you would walk outside, now now you're connecting, now you're listening. And uh um and when you get those experiences. When you get to feel that that healing experience, what these plants are able to provide, see it in your family, you know, make some making tea for folks here and there. It's like you get to witness the effects of it. No more fatty liver disease. Um, uh, um, and, you know, or like I could go on and on for forever, but like um, that's what really um, uh, where the relationship really begins. I guess, uh, cause you could visit with somebody all you want, but, but, you know, you, you visit with somebody, you find out that they were, uh, um, a plumber for 50 years and, and then, um, you know, and that's, that's great. You met, you met a plumber, but when your house has a major leak and they come and help you out, that's a whole, that's a different, that's a step up in your relationship with that person. And what are you going to do? You're going to reciprocate. Are you going to pay him or, uh you're gonna give them something right and uh and so the same thing with plants you could learn about them visit with them connect with them all the time uh but when you start exchanging in gifts between one another you know it becomes a whole other experience uh and and uh i think that opportunity to have human health increasing at the same time as environmental health is uh very possible, achievable, and fun, um, and something that is uh, sort of, um, I don't know how to say, like intrinsic, or um, normal, or like it's uh, kind of um, required, I guess, and uh, uh, yeah, well, I don't know, I wouldn't say possible, I'd say all these, uh, like, it's not like a thesaurus, but the um, uh overall good experience i guess <laughs> to be playing with all these relationships and then that gesture too that it takes all year too you're just always there's always things to do there's always uh plants to listen to there's always things to learn there's always connections to be made um you know just like in our human relationships there's always something going on um seasons and time can be can don't don't really have much much of a much of a say uh there's just always a lot going on a lot of listening that has to be done a lot of responsibilities and uh, to a lot of different relationships that we um are required to create um i guess that's what i was trying to say is that is that all, all of these uh the more time we spend with somebody, the more gifts that we're sharing with somebody, the more um, involved in a relationship that we get with somebody, the more responsibility that that relationship will carry. Um, and so utilizing this technique of visiting and listening to plants, especially now that they're all coming, is um, uh, um, something that is... Uh, uh, going to begin a whole cascade of, um, you know, kind of net positive, I guess, experiences. I wanted to, we'll, we'll open it up for some, some dialogue um, in a, in a few minutes, but I really like this idea of the plants are, the plants are telling us stories and that literally we're made up of plants and you just have to go outside and look at things and see that there's all kinds of evidence. But it made me think of, I think her name was Barbara McClintock and she won a Nobel prize. 
and um, and what she said her method was, I think it was around corn. I don't know exactly why. Uh, and uh, but she said she did it by listening to corn. And she was a scientist, right? A hardcore scientist winning a Nobel Prize who had this ability to be able to hear um, hear what those stories are. So it's like a a connection not only with the plants but also different sort of ways of knowing about and learning about and building those relationships um, relationships with the plants. Um, I, I also like that idea of like understanding um, the, the idea of gift in relation to plants. I remember the the late Robin Green, um, Bajibanes, his, his name was, and he talked about Anishinaabek specifically is from Treaty 3 area talking about um, our conceptions of sustainable development when that's what we said way back in the 80s. And he just said, Anishinaabe concepts are, instead of thinking about what you're going to take sustainably, you think about what your gift is going to be. Completely different way of thinking about what that relationship, um, what that relationship um, looks like. Um, one thing I, I also wanted to ask, because you know, developing these relationships ideally happen outside, although I suppose now people can start growing things inside, you know, like depending on what it is, if they want to eat the eat the plant or what whatever else. Um, what else is it about being outside in in the um, recently, maybe a couple months ago, um, you were in dialogue with a bunch of um, uh, scientists generally around, um, I guess, agriculture was this idea of, <laughs> was this idea of like embracing being outside, right? Instead of like, like bracing ourselves to not embrace the elements, like doing all these things to like, like reduce that kind of connection to what it's actually really like outside, like embracing cold or what, whatever it might be, like just accepting that there's gonna be certain, the world is gonna operate or creation is gonna operate in particular ways that you also have to, embrace and and um, connect with in some way. I thought that was that was also really interesting. Uh, and as I mentioned, there was a student in my class who heard that talk who who did that as part of a assignment, which is I have this assignment in class where I'm trying to get students to connect to the to the natural and to be able to listen. Um, they'll get the assign this because it's like, okay, if you see a plant at whatever time of year, because if, if I'm teaching in the winter, they're trying to do this in January, right? <laughs> and generally it's trees because plants are generally under the ground. And, or the plant, or sorry, not underground, under the snow, and they can't really, they can't really see them. So it's going to be mostly trees, maybe some some birds, and um, yeah, and it was really, uh, it was really interesting for her to to start to embrace that. It was because it's a mindset, right, of how you want to interact with the uh, with the natural. If you wanted to comment on that, because that's a part of it. Because people, I don't want to go out today because I don't like the weather. It's like, well, this might be actually the best day. To go right <laughs> this actually might be the best time to go learn this actually might be the best time to go connect so what your thoughts are on that yeah no for for sure for reals man like yeah just being uh um just embracing it we are a part of all of this and not a separate entity from <laughs> and um i think yeah we're very responsible to that process um and there are some things that can make it more comfortable but there is a consequence to comfort um i don't know who the heck who the, who says this and it's it's really harsh and maybe i shouldn't even say it but i'll say it anyway they said i think it was like some like thomas edison or something like that actually i think i'm right um but they said uh, a life of comfort is fit for a herd of swine <laughs> um just straight up and it's like whoa so it's interesting listening though to the effects of comfort and the devastation that happens when we're constantly seeking comfort because uh, if you were constantly seeking comfort, you would never exercise. And we know that the just historic negative health consequence of not exercising. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, every room that we have is 21 degrees Celsius. <laughs> and in the winter, we'll start our car from inside the house and we'll warm up our car before, you know, but uh for 10 minutes before we leave and in the summer we turn it on so that the car cools off before we leave. and so we're like just everything is 21 degrees and when we're just totally separated from our, our environment and um when when we are designed I, actually I, I kind of identify this as a gift a, a unique human gift in the variety of temperatures that we can live in 
um, like we can go into a sauna that's 125 degrees Celsius, no problem for an hour. Um, I, I did this, like, I got like real hooked on saunas and I was doing this like every day of the week. Um, that's really, that's more than when water would boil and, uh, and, and uh, you could sit in there for an hour. And then, you, and then also too, like I would ice bath and you could go into an ice bath. That's like uh, three degrees Celsius. And I stay in there for an hour and a half too. And like my daughter has to keep adding the ice to the bath because I keep melting it. And uh, it got to the point where I would just watch movies. And like, there's not too many creatures on the planet that can go uh, um, like at a species level, go from a, a 125 degrees Celsius to, um, you know, three degrees or, or go into a cryo chamber that is... Um, uh, minus 115 degrees Celsius, I think for a couple minutes, like the ability for our bodies to experience temperature ex extremes is pretty unique. And there's not too many creatures who are able to do that. And so it's easily, we can identify this as a, as a, as a gift. And, um, just the health perspectives of this, when you're looking at something like a sauna going into a really hot room, there's lots of studies that have been done on saunas in the last decade. Um, and like, if I told you that if that you by that, if you go into a room, that's 80 degrees Celsius or more, which is like a very, very cold, mild sauna uh, for 20 minutes or more for more than four days a week, that your chances of uh, uh, reducing risk of a cardiovascular event a heart attack or a stroke by almost 70 percent risk of a heart attack or a stroke uh, uh, risk reduction by going into a hot room for a couple of days a week um for for like a half hour it's an enjoyable experience anyways for most people will go to a sauna just because it's like the spa thing right this is a really incredible uh, benef health benefits to be had by experiencing and embracing uh, the heat. Same thing with the cold too, like uh, lots of mental health benefits with the cold um, and going into ice baths and cold showers and cryotherapy chambers and things like that. Huge benefit to your metabolism. It's, it's a really incredible experience. Um, it's not comfortable. Every minute sucks. <laughs> But you feel really good afterwards, uh, like, you know, or the next day, you, you feel so good. It's crazy. And this is something that we are designed to do, something that we're designed to thrive in is uh, being uncomfortable. And there's this devastation. Uh, I think uh, the chronic disease epidemic that we're facing now, the accelerated aging epidemic, um, all have its ties in um our constant search for comfort um and that that constant search for comfort separates you from from going into the forest the amount of mosquitoes spiders uh spider webs everywhere um and you get massive spiders cr crawling up your back if you don't tuck your shirt in and huge nasty big butt things landing on your head and and how like and how hard i've slapped myself sometimes is um you know things are almost knocking myself out uh one time because in balsam furs you get these big white spiders They're, the butt is like the size of a, uh can be like the size of a nickel that's a huge spider butt and then massive legs coming off the side and we use the the spruce, uh, the the balsam fir boughs for fire and to make like uh, comfortable seating, and so we get it all the time. And these bug, this spider, uh, got on me, and I hit my head so hard uh, that things got a little white. I was all wobbly, like in the UFC there for a second. I was like, whoa, and uh, and just like spider guts. So it's nasty. It's gross. It's uncomfortable. It's not an extremely and completely pleasurable experience to go out and pick medicine and to visit, be visiting plants. Um, it's uncomfortable almost all the time. And, um, but uh, to kind of have that ability to reframe the human experience is uncomfortable. Um, and that every opportunity that we uh, seek comfort, we're separating ourselves from 
the ability to live the lives that we are designed to um, when we don't exercise, when we don't go into a sweat lodge, when we don't embrace the cold and we hide away from it with minus 40 degree Canada, uh, 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 Canada goose parkas in September. <laughs> uh you're missing out on these opportunities to exercise gifts that make you as a species unique our long form endurance exercise we do it better than any other animal in the world out of any animal in the world who is going to reach 100 miles the fastest uh, every land mammal sorry um Everybody will always say birds uh, or whales or something crazy like that. But like out of all the land mammals, who is going to make it to 100 miles the fastest? And the answer is humans. Buddy does it in less than 12 hours every year. Um, and uh, there's 100 mile races that happen all over, all, over the, all over the world. 100 miles in less than 24 hours. 100 miles in one day. It's a long ways to go in a day. Um, and these are not like the most elite athletes. It's a whole different uh people who do these 100 mile races and everybody every single one of them says that it's not a physical um uh uh my, it's not my physical self that's preventing me from not uh, uh completing 100 miles it has everything to do with it's a mental battle and so it has very little to do with physical gifts and athletic uh, abilities as much as it is a, as a mental issue. Um, and so that really speaks to our capacity of our physical selves is, is designed to thrive in these uh, extreme and uncomfortable situations. Yeah, separations from that equals the health disaster that we're in now, never being hungry and making every one of our meals extremely hyper palatable experience no exercise, no embrace of temperature extremes uh, and living in 21 degrees Celsius all year long. Um, and then like, how many of you guys got allergies now? It's kind of funny um, how sniffly we're, we're, we're all getting already. We've so effectively separated ourselves from our environment that we cannot hardly even be reintroduced to it. That's the definition of an animal being domesticated um, is that they cannot be reintroduced to their natural environment. Um, and so I've been saying for years now that humans were the first domesticated species, um, and then the dog, and then, you know, maybe other, uh, animals afterwards, but we've so effectively domesticated ourselves. So we cannot even be reintroduced to our natural environment so that we cannot even leave our homes without, uh, losing breath and, uh, and just having to wipe our face all day long, all the boogies. Uh, from allergies. An allergy is a exacerbated response to uh, uh, to uh, what is now a pathogen that, you know, we're supposed to be always surrounded by pollen, always surrounded by plant matter, always surrounded by dust and small bits of fungus. These are all things that your body can learn how to adapt to and learn how to interact with. You separate yourselves from fungus and, and uh, um, pollen and, and dust and all, all of this matter in a HVAC sealed home. Um, your, your body has periods where it's separated from all of that experience and so when you're reintroduced to the fungus reintroduced to the pollen your body doesn't know what to do with it and you have this massive exacerbated inappropriate mass cell response that is allergies that we deal with all year every year it's because we're separated from our environment and we're designed to be living in it and with it um but yeah oh man it's just gonna go on and on <laughs> <laughs> but I can relate to that. I, uh, as when I was um, visiting a, a Sami friend in northern Finland, she said it was like mid December. She's like, "Hey, let's go for a swim." I'm thinking pool or something, but no, it was a big hole in the in the the river nearby. And I went, "I don't, I don't know if I can do that." But tell you the truth, she looks great. But I did make concerted effort this spring to embrace the cold. Um, because it, it it releases uh, adrenaline so you become really alert and aware and focused right so it makes you a lot more productive um uh, productive in work um 
I may have a little trouble adjusting to Toronto's whatever 40 plus degrees humidity type <laughs> type summer, but um, but I think that that's part of it is it isn't always going to be comfortable. And and from what I've been learning about it recently, because I've been paying attention, is that does build the mental um, capacity because it's all a mindset, right? Like it's it's um, it's a mindset. So um, I'm gonna. I'm going to stop there because there's a lot more to say and there might be some questions coming from or comments coming from folks who are here. Does, um, does anybody have any, I, want to, I haven't looked at the chat, like some people had to go, um, they're growing things. So people can put stuff in the, people can put stuff in the chat, but I did want to also point out that um, uh, Joseph was part of a CBC series that um, Duncan McHugh did called Back to the Land it was oh, yeah. great. I also assigned that to my class. And uh, I had a tiny little bit part in it because I actually didn't have the knowledge base to be able to answer his questions around. Because one of the things that they know about Indigenous peoples, a lot of what Joseph's been talking about is um, 20, Indigenous peoples caretake, I'll use that word, 20% of the world's land mass, but that's where 80% of the biodiversity is. And that's also where indigenous languages are spoken. So indigenous languages are really important to understanding and relating to um, the stories that plants have to tell and our own connection in terms of how we're even made up of plants. So um, Joe, you can comment on that while I scan through here and see if there's any, um, any specific uh, questions in the chat. <laughs> Yeah, no, for for sure. Um, I like we like we explained in in the in the beginning about trilliums. Um, learning the names of plants is super special. Uh, learning the the names of anything, like uh, oh, I guess it's it's step number one when you're looking to develop a relationship with somebody. Like how how many of you guys go up to somebody that who you don't know anything about and. Uh, just jump right into a bunch of crazy questions and most of us like the first thing that we ask somebody is what's your name and usually from that name you, you could gather a lot of information from somebody just based on their name and uh that's a courtesy i think we could be extending to plants as well um because they do have a lot to share with their name same with birds everything the the indigenous taxonomy of being uh beings is uh is, is really um eye-opening in the amount of connections the amount of observation that had to be involved in order for uh that name to exist um well like even with the trilliums I mean, it's not that it's not extremely fascinating but to describe the 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 two you know biggest loudest noises of the spring um or noticeable increases in noise in the spring being the plant the leaves just coming out and then when the flower chooses to bloom those are two really uh interesting things to kind of watch out for every spring and that's in the name of the plant other plants are named based on you know their the special connection they have with other creatures as well um and uh um there's a lot that you can gather in a name and I really appreciate it. Yeah. Duncan and uh, CBC kind of giving that opportunity to share the importance of everybody to be involved in learning the names of plants uh, because it's very successful at uh, positioning you in the center of indigenous knowledge <laughs> kind of like giving us the ability to everybody who's living here, the ability to say, this is a knowledge that I need um and oh yeah super fun there's um a question for Leora so people can listen to the series it's it I, I really liked it and uh, uh Leora wonder if Joe has any thoughts on idiopathic I might be pronouncing that wrong conditions or things that allopathic doctors can't explain or locate an origin for I may have not said that right but is this making sense to you joe this question uh, i'm wondering if joe has any thoughts on idiopathic conditions or uh, or things that allopathic doctors can explain or oh yeah um for for sure so a physician i could simplify this really easy and i'm not doing this in a belittling way at all um, um but a physician is trained exclusively 
in the differential diagnosis of disease and the treatment of said disease with pharmaceutical chemical interventions. Um, and so to that, that's like, it's, um, well, it's very narrow. I mean, if you cannot identify the um, etiology of a disease, if you don't know why it's there, um, is, is one thing. Mo most diseases we have very advanced theories on and, and that in research, we have a sometimes even a really clear understanding of what's happening in this disease, but it's called idiopathic when there's no treatment as well. When you don't know how to treat something or, uh, and, then, and then even looking in that, like uh, one of the medicines I shared was a lung medicine. And that lung medicine is really, really successful. I used it for COPD, some really chronic idiopathic irreversible diseases um, of which there's no, no intervention other than comfort measures to end of life or to palliation. And uh, the medicine helped did what it was supposed to do you see lung problems and you give lung medicine and it's kind of like really really simple um but um in the this in the attempt to discover a medicine that uh, uh to create a pharmaceutical drug they were able to copy they were able to create synthetic uh mimetics that were able to accomplish what that medicine does but it wasn't a profitable endeavor it wasn't a profitable experience and so it had to be abandoned so there's lots of medicine that uh, medications that were were and are able to be created, but it's it's not profitable and so it cannot be sought. Um, it cannot be pursued um, because this is a profit driven industry. And uh, but plants do not have that bias. They have what they're supposed to do and they do it. And so um, I like kind of just saying too that uh, to call something idiopathic uh, more often is inappropriately used because we have very advanced understandings into the pathology of disease, pathophysiology of disease. Um, but it's thrown around a lot when there's no intervention in place, um, uh, uh, um, especially when there's not even a comfort measures. Uh, um, and so with... Um, with our medicine, um, we, we identify what part of your body is not working appropriately, provide the medicine that restores that function. That's kind of like the basis and kind of how everything works. Um, and in the case of uh, prevention, we are using medicine on a regular basis, just constantly in chronic engagement with all of these different medicines because they taste good, because they make our food taste better. Like this medicine cabinet behind me is my herb and spice rack when I'm cooking. And so I'm just constantly engaging in all these different types of medicines um, all the time, which is good for them because, uh, you know, their protocol makes me help them. Uh, but, but it's good for me because I'm restoring normal function to certain parts of my body that are going awry um, and, and uh, just constantly setting things straight, constantly going to the gym. Well, I'm not going to the gym. I'm drinking tea. It's so like my body's got to go to the gym, though, um, to be able to deal with that and overcome that and become stronger. Um, and so um, idiopathic disease um, is by far my favorite sort of field to, to work in. Um, and those are the people who are usually willing to kind of do anything because all they've ever heard their whole life is that there is nothing. Um, and so the readiness and willingness of those in the, those folks are is really powerful too. So um, we'll just have one last question, and that is because it's already two thirty, and folks all have to do their. But we are recording this, so people want to go back and 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 get some amazing advice on how to reconnect there with plants, which basically were kind of plants, I guess, in some ways. Is um, the question around, can, can you harvest in cities? Like, is, is there something about cities where it's not a good idea or does it matter? The, it sounds like the plant's gonna do what it's gonna do regardless of where it is, but any thoughts mm -hmm. on that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, issues in picking in urban areas, mainly just pollution related things, um, just garbage and toxins in the soil. You gotta watch where you're picking. Some medicine though is very immune to that. I mean, a lot of tree bark is um is is very very um clean um 
So my favorite area to gesture to is in Thunder Bay because, <laughs> uh, you know, like where Thunder Bay is now, that used to be the reserve. And on the Fort Williams side, that's where Thunder Bay used to be until Thunder Bay burnt down, all the factories burnt down. And so then they, they switched. <laughs> they made Fort William live, uh, start their community and all the rubble. Thunder Bay um, uh, was able to develop the reserve side, which is almost always the greener, nicer, untouched side. <laughs> so anyways, you get all these, uh, the switch that happens, um, but in the rubble of, uh, there's these really crazy uh, uh, leukemia rates in children. I forget exactly what it is. I don't want to mess it up, but it's like, it's like almost a guarantee um, for children growing in, up in Thunder Bay or sorry, in uh, Fort William First Nation. Um, and it's, it's actually really, really terrifying. But um, with this, uh, they do a lot of studies on uh, environmental toxins uh, accumulating in plant tissues. And yeah, really able to quickly realize that with trees, with barks, there's almost nothing to worry about. They're very, very effective at cleaning out or, or preventing the accumulation of toxins in their tissue. So in urban areas, you learn your trees uh, and uh, you're, you're well on your way, you know, and, and with that, um, there's a few plants that are resistant to toxins, but starting with trees is really important. That's actually like how we learn about medicine too. You learn your trees first, then you learn everybody who is beneath those. Uh, the trees control everything that is living underneath them. And uh, it makes finding medicine easier because you don't have to go through the forest. You can look at a certain combination of trees and say, hey, I bet it might be over there. And then you go over there and you're, you're either able to find it, the medicine you're looking for, uh, just by using the trees or if the medicine is not there then you have a place to put it too so you kind of use trees as your biggest uh, uh, sort of most important metric to understand what goes where uh, what is where and uh, so so uh, a lot of urban uh, dwelling folks are able to focus on learning trees and sometimes it's even yeah more advantageous than people immersed in green spaces looking at everything all at once it's it's kind of interesting watching all that unfold but trees are really important in in that in these cases i think i have to change my assignment for the winter to uh, address this <laughs> this eco, this teaching um I'm trying to try to like what everything focus on focus on the trees for uh, for urban people as they're learning how like I try to get them to try to connect students to try to connect in ways that kind of make sense and actually to be honest they kind of are drawn to that anyway that's usually what they focus on in their assignments so maybe it's just like this inclination maybe that humans um humans have because trees kind of look like us because they're upright and have arms and such <laughs> that's what that's what i'll tell myself that's a tree i want to look like yeah <laughs> all naughty and old because it's the healthiest stressed out tree but <laughs> that's what i'll tell people but it knows what to do <laughs> <laughs> so um I think with, with that, well, there's a lot of people who who are having to uh, who are having to to leave. We've got the hour and a half. I'll I'll just leave you with the last couple of words about what you'd like to see people do for the rest of the the day, or what are you going to do for the rest of the day? Because it's it's a nice day. When we chatted to prepare for this, it was like snow, but now it's like nice, yeah. sunny, and now you can see the flowers and and green stuff on the ground is uncovered. So I'll just leave you with the last word here. Yeah, I am, uh, and I encourage everybody uh, the same the same thing. Like um, taking taking what you learn, um, taking what I uh, learn, and uh, just <laughs> there's no substitute for time out on the field. Um, actually, being out there, and it, and it really there's not you don't nothing matters like uh, uh, um, just being there. Um, and you're able to learn so much just in some simple observations. Um, my my daughter, like I said, she's learning everything about medicine very passively, but she was able to identify eight different seeds in a in the gizzard of a grouse. So it's like, what the heck? Like I had no idea. Like it's just because she's out there with us. She's hardly listening to anything that I'm saying but she's just being curious and being outside and just with that she's learning so much it's overwhelming and it's actually an incredible experience to 
as a parent to be able to watch. So just being out there is super important. And I, I have no plans myself um, the, today and for the rest of this evening. And so I'll probably just go to the campus uh, at Fleming. There's a real nice green space. And we just walk and check things out and just be and kind of looking around and lifting leaves up and looking at all the plants coming up and all the shapes and structures and just saying neat and spend just spending time outside. It's one of the most important things. Sometimes it's very hard for us to be able to do this. You know, we talk about that uncomfortable uh, um, issue, um, but um it is uh, very valuable. And so I hope that's what we kind of helped with today is to kind of give us the opportunity to see value in green spaces and in just simple walks and sitting in front of a plant and visiting and how powerful of an experience and connection that can create and relationships and responsibilities and, you know, and my passion, I guess, um, I think uh, to end um, um, responsibility is what keeps us here. <laughs> if you have nothing to be responsible for, um, these tend to be uh, uh, hard issues to deal with. And so um, being there for plants and responsible for plants, some folks really connect with that idea responsibility is important if we have no responsibilities i mean we know what what those people in our lives uh go through and uh so forcing these responsibilities on ourselves you know it's a good thing for us a good thing for the environment but also for our mental health it's very powerful as well uh so yeah just being out there connecting listening um anywhere and everywhere that you can um, there's no substitute for time out on the field. I feel like I need to go out and do that. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> it's only so much I can learn from reading yet another peer-reviewed article, although those are important too. Um, thank you so much for spending time with us. Joseph, running from one minute or one meeting at 10, not getting to visit the plans to visiting with us. That's why I'm going to look at this. You're, you're visiting with us and and I, it sounds like looking at the comments, people learned a great deal. And, um, and I appreciate your time on a, a beautiful day and, and go to enjoy the time in Flemington um, Park. And everybody else, go, go outside and enjoy. And, and maybe next time we meet and visit again, you'll be able to share stories about what you learned after this Earth Day, April 22nd in 2022. That's a lot of two, two, twos. Maybe that's significant. But uh, um, with that, I'll let everybody go. And again, Shmigwetz Joseph for sharing um, sharing with us. Bye, everyone. Yeah, thank you so much. It was super fun. <laughs>